Mahama Udga Liyayana. The Sanskrit word Maha has three meanings, great many and victorious. As an elder, one is respected by many kings and great ministers. Having studied the sutras in the Tripitaka, an elder has victoriously transcended all non-Buddhist religions. Maudya Lyayana is Sanskrit and means descendant of a family of bean gatherers. His name also means Tony Brood because his ancestors ate two leaves when they cultivated the way. He is also called Kolita after the tree where his father and mother prayed to the spirit of that tree for a son. This venerable one was the foremost in spiritual penetration in his cultivation of the way. When he first certified to Ahatri, he obtained six kinds of spiritual penetrations, the heavenly eye, the heavenly ear, the knowledge of others' thoughts, the knowledge of past lives, the extinction of outflows, and the complete spirit. With the heavenly eye, one sees not only the affairs of man, but every action of the gods as well. With the heavenly ear, one hears the gods speaking. With the knowledge of others' thoughts, one knows that what others are thinking and planning before they speak. With the knowledge of past lives, not only does one know what they are thinking, but one clearly knows their causes and effects from former lives. As to the extinction of outflows, all people have outflows. They are like leaky bottles. Pour something in the top and it flows out at the, the bottom. The bigger the hole, the faster the flow. The smaller the hole, the smaller the flow. If there are no holes, there are no leaks, no outflows. The extinction of outflows is the absence of leaks. What outflows do people have? Food and drink become the outflows of feces and urine. If you like to get angry as an outflow, if you are greedy, hateful, or stupid, you have outflows. Pride and doubt are outflows too. With outflows, nothing can be retained, but without them, all leaks disappear. Our flows are simply our phones. People, we, if we don't have big sicknesses, we have small sicknesses. And if we don't have small sicknesses, we have little phones. If we don't have big outflows, we have small outflows. And if we don't have small outflows, we have slow leaks, little bad habits. A lot can be said about outflows. The absence of them is called the penetration of the extinction of outflows. The penetration of the complete spirit is also called the penetration of the realm of the spirit and the spirit penetration of everything as you will it to be. The complete spirit means that you have an indescribable power. Not even the ghosts and spirits can know of your thousand changes and ten thousand transformations, for you have penetrated all realms and states without obstruction. As you will means that everything is the way you want it. If you want to go to the heavens, you go. If you want to go down into the earth, you go. You can walk into the water without drowning, and into the fire without burning. If you're in a room and think, I'd rather not go out the door, you can walk right through the wall. How can this be? It's as you will according to your thought. However you think you would like it to be, that's the way it is. It just have to make a wish and you attain your aim. These are the six spiritual penetrations. When Mahama Udga Liyana first obtained these penetrations, he looked for his father and mother, not so much his father actually as his mother. Where was she? His mother was in hell. 
Why? Because she had not believed in the triple jewel, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And what is more, she had slandered them. She had also eaten fish eggs and flesh, and thereby had killed many beings. Seeing her in hell, Maudgalia Yana sent her a bowl of food. He took it in one hand and hid it with the other, because she was afraid the other hungry ghosts would see it and try to steal it from her. Being greedy herself, she knew that other hungry ghosts were greedy too, and so she covered it over stealthily. Although it was good food, her heavy comic obstacles prevented her from eating it. When the food reached her mouth, it turned into flaming coals, which burned her lips. Maudgalia Yana's spiritual powers could not prevent the food from turning into fire, so he asked the Buddha to help him. The Buddha told him to save his mother by arranging an ulambana offering. Ulambana means releasing those who are hanging upside down. The Buddha told Maudgalia Yana that on the fifth day of the seventh lunar month, the day of the Buddha's delight, and the monks Pravarana, he should offer all varieties of food and drink to the Sangha of the Ten Directions. In this way, he could rescue his mother so she could leave suffering and obtain bliss. Maudgalia Yana followed these instructions, and his mother was born in the heavens. Not only was his mother saved, but all the hungry ghosts in their house simultaneously left suffering and attained bliss. Now you may say, I don't believe that food and drink become fire when hungry ghosts eat them. Of course you don't believe it, but the world is full of strange, strange things. It would be hard to speak about them all. How much of the less can one be clear about those things beyond this world? Let's take water, for example. People and animals see water as water, but the gods see it as lapis lazuli, and the hungry gods see it as fire. It's all a question of individual karmic manifestations. Gods have the karmic retribution of gods, men of men, and ghosts of ghosts. This is how, with the Buddha's help, Maudgalia Yana saved his mother. Maha Kasyapa. Again, Maha means great, many, and victorious. The Sanskrit word Kasyapa means great total clan because Maha Kasyapa's ancestors saw the pattern on the back of the drum turtle and used it to cultivate the way. Kasyapa also means light drinking clan because his body shone with the light which was so bright it seemed to drink up all other light. Why did his body shine? Seven Buddhas ago, in the time of the Buddha Vipassin, there was a poor woman who decided to repair and re uh, a ruined temple. The roof of the temple had been blown off, and the images inside were exposed to the wind and rain. The woman went everywhere and asked for help. And when she had collected enough money, she commissioned a goldsmith to regild the images. By the time he was finished, the goldsmith fell in love with her and said, You have attained great merit from this work, but we should share it. You may supply the gold, and it will furnish the labor free. So the temple was rebuilt, and the images regilded. The goldsmith asked the woman to marry him, and in every life, for ninety-one compass, they were husband and wife, and their bodies shone with purple and golden light. Mahakasyapa was born in India, in Magadha. When he was twenty, his father and mother wanted him to marry, but he said, 
The woman and Mary must shine with golden light. Unless you find such a woman, I won't marry. Eventually, they found one, and they were married. As a result of their good karma, their bodies shone with gold light, and they cultivated together and investigated the doctrines of the way. When Mahakasyapa left home to become a big shrew, his wife became a big sunni called Purple and Golden Light. Mahakasyapa's personal name was Pipala because his parents prayed to the spirit of the Pipala tree. To grant them a son, as the first patriarch, Mahakasyapa holds an important position in Buddhism. When Shakyamuni Buddha spoke the Dharma, the great Brahma Heaven King presented him with a golden lotus, and Shakyamuni Buddha held up the flower before the assembly. At that time, hundreds of thousands of gods and men were. Present, but no one responded except Mahakasyapa, who simply smiled. Then the Buddha said, "I have the right Dharma Eye Treasury, the wonderful Nivanik Mind, the real mark which is unmarked. This Dharma door of mind to my transmission has been transmitted to Kasyapa. Thus, Mahakasyapa received." The transmission of Dharma and became the first Buddhist patriarch. Venerable Master, Venerable Mahakasyapa is still、uh, present in the world. When he left home under the Buddha, he was already one hundred and sixty years old. By the time Shakyamuni Buddha had spoken Dharma for forty-nine years in over three hundred Dharma assemblies, Kasyapa was already. Over two hundred years old, after Shakyamuni Buddha entered Nirvana, Kasyapa went to southwestern China to Chicken Food Mountain in Yunnan Province. It has been over three thousand years since the Buddha's Nirvana, but Mahakasyapa is still sitting in Samadhi in Chicken Food Mountain, waiting for Maitreya Buddha to appear in the world. At that time, he will give Maitreya the bow, which the four heavenly kings gave Shakyamuni Buddha, and which Shakyamuni Buddha gave him. And his work in this world will be finished. Many cultivators travel to Chicken Food Mountain to worship the Patriarch Kasyapa, and on the mountain there are always three kinds of light: Buddha light, Gold light, and Silver light. Those with sincere hearts can hear the big bell ringing inside the mountain. It rings by itself, and although you can't see it, you can hear it for several hundred miles. It's an inconceivable state. Mahakasyapa was the foremost of the Buddha's disciples, both in ascetic practices and in age. None of the Buddha disciples were older, and none of them endured more suffering. The term ascetic practice means making an effort, raising up one's spirit with courage and vigor. The cultivation of the twelve kinds of ascetic practices is a sign that the Buddha Dharma is being maintained. For as long as they are practiced, the Dharma will remain in the world. If They are not practiced. The Buddha Dharma will disappear. Of the twelve ascetic practices, the first two deal with clothing. Wearing wrapped robes, one gathers unwanted cloth from garbage heaps, washes it, and sews it into a robe. There are many advantages in wearing wrapped robes. First of all, they decrease in greed. When you wear them, your heart is peaceful and calm. They also prevent others from being greedy. If you wear fine, expensive clothes, others may become envious and may even try to steal them. But no one wants to steal your robes. So the first ascetic practice benefits you and others. Those who have left home are called tattered sons because they wear rough robes, wearing only three robes. One's only possessions are three robes, a bow, and a sitting cloth. The first robe is the great robe.
the Sangati made of 25 strips of cloth in 108 patches, which is one when luxury sutras or visiting the king. The second is the outer robe, the Uttara Sangha, made of seven pieces, which is one when bowing, when bowing repentance ceremonies and worshipping the Buddha. The third is the inner robe in five pieces, the Antavasaka, which is one at all times to walk in, to travel in, and to entertain guests with only three robes, a bow and a sitting cloth. One teaches others to be content and are greedy for a lot of possessions. Always begging for food, one always takes one's bow to beg and does not cook for oneself. Begging in succession, one begs from house to house in regular order without discriminating between the rich and the poor. If by the seventh house no food is obtained, one doesn't eat on that day. One doesn't think, I want to beg from the poor, not the rich, or I want to beg from the rich and not the poor. Mahakasyapa once said, poor people are to be pitied. If they don't plant blessings now, in the future they will be even poorer. He begged exclusively from the poor. Subhuti, on the other hand, begged only from the rich. If they are rich, he reasoned, we should help them continue to plant blessings and meritorious virtue. If they don't make offerings to the triple jewel, Next life, they have no money, and so they, he begged only from the rich. But the Buddha scolded both of them. You too have the hearts of ahas, he said, because you discriminate in your begging. To beg properly, one should go from house to house without discrimination. Eating only once a middle in the middle of the way. This means that you do not eat in the morning or in the evening, but only between the hours of 11 and 12 o'clock in the morning. Some who don't understand the Buddha Dharma think that eating once in the middle of the day means simply eating only one lunch. It actually means that one doesn't eat in the morning or in the evening, but only once in the middle of the day. In China, when one receives the precepts, they ask Nong Chu, which means, can you keep them? The precept answers Nong Chu, which means, I can. If one meets in the morning, noon, and evening, however, one can answer Nong Chu, which sounds the same, but means, I can eat. Eating once a day at noon is one of the Buddha's rules because the Buddha only responded to offerings of food at noon. Gods eat in the morning, animals eat in the afternoon, and gods eat at night. Those who have left home do not eat at night because when gods come out at night to look for food and hear the sound of chopsticks when they run to steal the food. The food the people are eating turns into fire in the gods' mouths, and they get angry and take revenge by making people sick. Reducing the measure of what you eat. If you can eat three bowls, then eat only two and a half. If you can eat two bowls, then eat only one and a half. Always eat a little less. If you eat too much, your stomach can't hold it, and you have to do a lot of work on the toilet. Eat less. Not drinking juices after noon. After 12, you don't drink apple juice, orange juice, milk, or any kind of juice at all. How much less being called broth? True ascetics don't drink juice after noon. Some people cultivate one of the two. One or two of these practices and some cultivate more. Some cultivate only one and some cultivate all twelve. It's not fixed. It depends upon how strong you are. Since cultivators can't avoid the questions of clothing, food and dwelling, 
these 12 ascetic practices have been established to deal with um, the five which concern dwelling, um, dwelling in an Araniya. Araniya is a Sanskrit word which means still and quiet place still and quiet place in an aranya one is left alone and there are no distracting noises it is said what the eyes don't see won't cause the mouth to water what the ears don't hear won't cause the mind to transgress when people see food they give rise to desire for it and their mouths water if your ears don't hear confusing sounds there is no efficiency in your mind. In a still quiet place, it is easy to cultivate diligently and enter samadhi.